my name is Simon Wolf, the Managing Director of Marlowe Strategy. Uh, over the coming weeks, I'm holding one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading experts on East Africa. With the conflict spilling over from Ethiopia, growing tensions between Kenya and Somalia, recent elections in Uganda and the ongoing negotiations between Sudan, Egypt and Ethiopia over the GERD, there is much to talk about. My first conversation is with Rashid Abdi, one of the most insightful commentators on the Horn of Africa. Rashid, a very warm welcome, and thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Simon. I'll get straight into it, Rashid. How bad is it in Tigray at the moment? How, how significant is the killing of Sayem Mesfin, the former and respected foreign minister? What, future, what does the future hold for the region? Will it be reintegrated into Ethiopia? Will Eritrea lay claim to Tigray? Will the Tigrayans seek independence? I know there's a few questions in there, but uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Um, there is no doubt that um, the situation in Tigray uh, is very dire. Um, I think this is the third month um, since the outbreak of hostilities. Uh, the conflict has uh, quickly escalated to a point where uh, you now have, I think, uh, roughly uh, close to 100,000 displaced people in camps uh, outside um, um, Tigray in, in, in Sudan. Um, you have about 4.5 million people now facing uh, a real prospect of, of starvation. Uh, aid agencies have faced uh, a lot of restrictions in actually delivering uh, food uh, to those people in need. So this conflict is no longer about law and operations. This conflict has now escalated to a massive humanitarian crisis, probably the worst now uh, active humanitarian crisis in, in, uh, in the Horn of Africa. The EU uh, has been putting a lot of pressure, and I know that uh, in a few days' time, the EU will dispatch uh, a senior official to Tigray to assess uh, the situation. So I think just the humanitarian consequences of the conflict uh, are quite uh, uh, shocking and quite appalling. Um, and I think uh, the emphasis must be on, on really a quick resolution of the humanitarian crisis first before we talk about the political issues. I think lives are at risk and uh, those people who I need now uh, need help and those must be the priority. Coming to the issue of the uh, conflict, there is no doubt that uh, uh, you have the, the hallmarks of uh, um, a cri uh, an armed conflict that is entering uh, a very protracted uh, phase. You also have um, the prospect of a serious uh, grinding uh, stalemate uh, developing. Um, the, there is no longer a front in this conflict. The TPLF has retreated into the mountain, mountains and is now conducting a, a guerrilla campaign. So it is engaging the ENDF and the Eritrean uh, troops in multiple areas. So the conflict has actually spread to every part of um, uh, Tigray. Um, there's no single front. Um, the government's uh, capability has, has not been demonstrated really beyond crushing the TPLF. Um, because if the, if the aim of the military campaign <coughs> was to basically assert control over uh, Tigray, that has not happened. The government appointed uh, an administration to go and take care, to, to go and uh, basically take control of Mekele. Um, they, the administrator's name is uh, uh, Mulu, um, and Mulu Nega um, has actually struggled even to, to, to create an office in Mekele, let alone in other parts of, uh, of uh, Tigray. So in many ways, and, and this is borne out by conversations I've had with aid agencies, the government that used to exist, the structures of government that existed before the invasion have collapsed. And you haven't replaced uh, those structures with any alternative structures. So what you now have essentially is now uh, a, a region that has reverted back to anarchy. There are no structures of government. Um, ultimately, at some point, the situation could actually develop to a breakdown of complete law and order. So um, Addis Ababa, if Addis Ababa's strategic um, interest was to take control of Tigray, I think 
the, the, the reality is that they have lost Tigray. Um, the war has also progressed in a very, um, I think, troubling uh, trajectory. It is no longer about, um, I think, uh, taking control of uh, Tigray or even dislodging the TPLF. Um, the Prime Minister's, uh, Prime Minister Abiy's government has assembled a coalition of um, parties uh, or has involved in this conflict, allies who have um, history, a bad history with, T with, with Tigray. One of course is uh, the Eritrean government, which has an ax to grind against the TPLF. They blame the TPLF for the wars, the border wars of the early 2000s. And so this is a chance I think for them to exact uh, revenge. Uh, and so you see a very brutal scorched earth campaign by the Eritrean military uh, committing massive uh, atrocities. Uh, and also you have at, uh, an Addis Ababa, which is now engaged in a brutal decapitation campaign um, in which they are targeting the historical core, the leadership of the TPLF. And I think uh, Simon, you hinted at, at Sayum's uh, death. Sayum was not just a TPLF leader. He is one of the most well-regarded um, uh, foreign ministers Ethiopia has had in recent years. He's the man who built the current uh, generation of the foreign service. You know, he's a mentor to many young people who are in the foreign service and has a very good reputation and credibility uh, beyond uh, actually even Ethiopia in the region. So for this man to be shot point blank uh, in the head, uh, gangland style, I think uh, clearly sent, uh, sent shivers down everyone's spine and is a clear indication that this conflict has now become much more than a law and operation. So clearly- Can I the ask you, I mean, I, I, sorry to, to cut across here there. I, I, I'm fascinated with what Abi uh, 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 Ahmed's end game is here. He's fighting on multiple fronts in Aromia uh, in, in Benishangul, Gumuz. What, what does he have to get out of this? Excellent question. I think, um, um, I think the, the, the Prime Minister um, clearly has, his strategy has evolved over time. Uh, I don't think he, he, he went into this conflict uh, expecting a, grind mate, uh, you know, a grinding style, stalemate. He clearly hoped, uh, you know, or his strategy told that victory will be easy and quick. The TPLF was weak. Um, and clearly we are seeing the reality on the ground is that this is a conflict that will drag on for years. Uh, this is a, a conflict that will, is beginning to suck in um, other, other, is to draw in other actors beyond, uh, beyond the region. Um, and so this has all the hallmarks of a crisis that is going to be very big. And so what is his end game? Is, is, is difficult to tell. I think um, the much we know is that at least he has achieved a bit of tactical victory, which is that he's crushed the TPLF or rather pushed it into a corner. Uh, he has demonstrated uh, to other federal states that you cannot, um, you cannot uh, take on the might of the federal forces and expect not to be crushed. And so he's projecting power um, some of his, I think, early rhetoric also suggested a bit of triumphalism and uh, a more optimistic scenario of now we can focus on the political process. I think the prospect of holding um, a political process in the midst of uh, a war is always uh, very uh, daunting. Um, and I suspect that um, um, he will struggle to shift the nation and the focus of the nation to an election when there is a conflict uh, which is very nasty and which is simmering. So the end game is unclear, but uh, he has achieved a bit of tactical victory, uh, but Ethiopia is, 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 will be in, in serious conflict unless there is a serious change of uh, strategy on the part of the Abiy government. You, you mentioned before um, about Eritrea. Mm. Um, more broadly, do you think that this could signal the, the start of a realignment of the Horn of Africa? Where do other East African nations stand on this? From in hindsight, it is clear that the, <clears throat> the campaign in Tigray would not have been prosecuted without um, the involvement uh, and, the, and the, actually the, the, the very active involvement of Eritrea. 
Um, for, two, for over two years, there has been a lot of uh, toing and froing between um, Addis Ababa and Asmara, um, very high, many high level meetings, um, which were um, explained as part of a grand strategy to create uh, what they called a tripartite alliance in the Horn, involving um, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia. Um, and there was a lot of talk that uh, this would lead to some kind of uh, a discussion on, on economic integration. Um, and, you know, this was the, uh, you know, the, the line which uh, was coming out of all these capitals. But clearly behind the scenes, I think there's no doubt that um, these meetings were largely uh, focused on creating or on actually prosecuting this campaign in Tigray. So in many ways, this was the pre-planning for the war. Um, and, and so there is, uh, Abi would not have, have engaged, would not have conducted this campaign in Tigray without help from the Eritreans. He needed a front uh, in, in the West and that could only have come uh, with the approval of Eritrea. And this explains also uh, part of this um, calculations of Abi in making peace with Eritrea. Um, the, there is a convergence of interest between uh, Abi and uh, the, the, the president of uh, Eritrea, Isaias Afewerki. The two leaders are brought together by their antipathy towards um, the TPLF, their interest to dislodge the TPLF. Um, but I think it is interesting to note that despite this convergence of interest, uh, at some point, I think there will be definitely some tensions between these two uh, actors largely because um, I think uh, there is a history which is, uh, which is very bitter, which has not been resolved. There is a border tension which has not uh, been resolved through a formal uh, peace treaty um, and which of course uh, creates very difficult uh, problems for the two leaders. Um, and I think also there is a new, there is um, a growing um, perception in Tigray that the Eritrean, um, uh, military is not just there to hold territory for the ENDF, but has its own ambitions of occupation. And I think that is that in the coming weeks will be more cre crucial in determining how these conflicts uh, eventually, uh, you know, what course it takes. If Eritrea uh, uh, progressively becomes an occupation force in Tigray, that will begin, I think, to undermine uh, Prime Minister Abiy's uh, government. Uh, because already there is a lot of um, tension within his own government on the on the on this very visible, clear role which Eritrea is playing in the conflict. So the longer this conflict uh, drags on, the the higher the probability of actually um, it creating serious tensions uh, and eventually leading to uh, a divergence of interest between the two. And that I think will be the crunch point. That will, will, will decide whether uh, this conflict also uh, dies down or escalates further, because this conflict could easily, again, reignite the old border war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. You've mentioned before um, the political process in Ethiopia. I note that there are upcoming elections in February in Somalia, May for yes. Somaliland, June, obviously, for Ethiopia. There are elections also for South Sudan uh, and next year in Sudan and Kenya. How should this conflict be viewed in light of those elections? I think the prospect of, first of all, Abi conducting any credible elections in the midst of a war um, is very difficult. Um, the, any, legi any, 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 uh, any, any electoral outcome in the midst of conflict will always be contested. And um, the, the likelihood of actually Abi um, railroading the country into an election and then legitimizing himself, but then being much even much more diminished and much more weakened is very real. And that I think is the danger that Abi will take advantage of this war to push the country through a very quick election process and says that he has, he needs a, a mandate renewal. He wants legitimacy and um, then call an election very quickly. And also remember <clears throat> the bulk of um, Ethiopia's opposition is actually in jail and detention. You know, the entire Oromo leadership is in jail and detention. So this is a leader who faces no real contest if he wants to call an election today. 
he he has also sidelined completely. He's actually eviscerated the entire uh, political opposition. And um, people are saying that if he conducts an election in the current context, uh, that that any outcome will lack any legitimacy because it will simply be a coronation and not an election. And so that I think is is a real danger. And uh, it looks like the prime minister is headed down that route. Now there is an alternative, I think, way or another, um, I think, uh, step, another change, of course, which um, the prime minister can take, which is he can use this uh, crisis in Tigray to actually, uh, and also the, the looming elections to actually make peace. Um, he can say, um, I need, um, I need to free up the political opposition. I need to create a more credible electoral process. And in return, I want to also de-escalate um, uh, Tigray, if not uh, dialogue with the TPLF, but at least uh, a reduction in violence uh, and an improvement in the humanitarian situation. So if he does that <clears throat> and then conducts uh, a sort of a, uh, you know, a, a relatively open electoral process, then he can actually strengthen his hand and I think gain credibility regionally. But at the moment, I think there's no doubt in my mind that the prime minister has severely damaged his, his, his reputation. Um, the perception in the region is that um, Abiy Ahmed is no longer a reformer, but uh, an African strongman and um, probably uh, is headed down the wrong path. Now, the impact this conflict in, in, a, uh, in Ethiopia is having on the regional politics is very clear. Uh, tensions have been uh, growing with Sudan, not directly over the Tigray conflict, but because the Tigray conflict has also created, has, has also um, ignited other uh, conflicts. Um, there is a, there were, for many years, there was this border tension between uh, Ethiopia and Sudan to do with um, the sovereignty of uh, a piece of uh, land, agricultural land called Fashaga. Uh, the, in December, uh, one month into the conflict, the Sudanese army moved into Fashaga and reclaimed this territory because they, cal they calculated that this, the Ethiopian government was too distracted by the conflict in Tigray. And so this was a good opportunity for the Sudanese uh, to demonstrate, to basically take control of land which they consider their own sovereign territory. But also they took an opportunity uh, uh, largely based on the perception that Ethiopia was too weakened because of this internal conflict in Tigray. So there's a danger, of course, of other do dormant conflicts uh, you know, erupting because of uh, this. The Kenyans have been worried as well, um, not just about the Tigray conflict, but also of the conflict in, in Oromia, which is beginning to spill over into Northern Kenya. So the, the, in, in, in early January, the prime minister of Ethiopia visited Kenya and uh, there was a meeting uh, between uh, him and uh, the Kenyan president uh, Uhuru Kenyatta in uh, the ta border town of Moyale, where an agreement of sorts were, was, was reached broadly to manage um, the conflict and the border tensions uh, much more, um, I think, uh, robustly. So there's no doubt that, uh, you know, you cannot inoculate regional states from the crisis in Tigray. Uh, but also, I think, uh, let's, not, let's not forget that Tigray is just one conflict in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is now a country racked by multiple conflicts. And I think how the, the prime minister proceeds in the coming few months will determine whether Ethiopia resolves this crisis or at least diminishes this crisis, multiple crises, or actually inflames them. Could this reshuffling of power um, inspire you know, the revival of other ethnic tensions and border consolidation? I was thinking specifically of South Sudan and the tensions between Riek Mashar and Salva Kiir. Could this conflict perhaps inspire the continuance of those, those tensions? Remember Ethiopia uh, was a key regional player had uh, huge um, stakes in Ethiopia, in, in uh, South Sudan, in Sudan, uh, in Somalia. And the more Ethiopia becomes a more in, inward looking power, withdraws from uh, regional peacekeeping missions, um, and the more weaker its hands becomes in actually um, stabilizing or um, creating that equilibrium that used to exist. 
Um, and as you suggested, you know, South Sudan was one area where the, Sudan, the Ethiopians had, had, um, had actually some, some leverage because um, they had um, in particular some form of uh, uh, support uh, to react Machar and his group. And so a weakened Ethiopia probably may give Kir uh, more, more flexibility to move against Mashar. But this is speculation on my part. I think the reality is that um, we are still in the early stages of this crisis uh, spilling over. I think we will only know the full impact once, uh, I think, in a few months' time. And that will depend largely on how the situation in, in Tigray uh, proceeds. If the war becomes much more serious. If Ethiopia and Sudan go to, to war, then that is even more risky because what it will do is eventually it will give the Sudanese the, the excuse they need to open some kind of a, a supply route for the TPLF. And most likely also, I have no doubt in my mind that that conflict could actually even draw in the Egyptians. And then you have an almighty uh, crisis in your hand. You have actually uh, a huge regional war. Of course, it plays into the issues over the GERD, the dam. I mean, what is the connection between that, those, those ongoing discussions and this conflict? Yeah. At the moment, I think uh, we need to be cautious about the impact on GERD because the GERD has become much more of a technical uh, problem. Of course, uh, there is, of course, uh, pressure politically on it. Uh, and moods, uh, political temperature, when it's heated, the, walks, the talks also uh, grind. But this, in, a, in a way, the talks have become much, uh, much more better inoculated against this multiple crisis. And I think, um, so the diplomatic shuttling and uh, ritual of these meetings will continue in some shape and form. Um, the, there is uh, also speculation that um, uh, the Egyptians, you know, uh, want a deal badly and may actually be peacemakers rather than conflict makers. And so I think these are interesting uh, dynamics. Um, the, the notion that uh, Eritrea is now weakened and so will give, um, Cairo is now interested in, in, in coming to this conflict largely to weaken Ethiopia further, I think could be, could be a mistake because what the Egyptians need more is not an Ethiopian conflict, but an Ethiopia with which it can make a deal. It can cut a deal. So I think those are those are important dynamics. I think to put into into context. So to go back to your question, I think uh, there is a danger that these talks could be impacted by the conflict and the crisis. But let's hope that uh, you know the the parties know what is at stake and know the the the, the need for a deal, and uh, it may not be too late. Uh, it, I think there will be an, an added even an added pressure to keep the parties on the table. And I think uh, one factor which we haven't talked about um, at the moment, which is uh, the, the new administration in, 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 in the US, uh, the Biden government, I think, will definitely have an impact, not just on the Tigray conflict, but on how also the guard discussions are managed. Um, it is quite conceivable that uh, Biden will appoint a special envoy for the Horn, who will, I think, definitely boost uh, these uh, uh, guard negotiations. And even more importantly, I think um, the Trump administration became very partisan in the GAD discussions. They clearly sided with, with Cairo and actually inflamed tensions with, with uh, Ethiopia. So I think Biden, Biden's government will come with, with, with really a very strict and neutral position. Uh, and that I think could be helpful. Um, despite the, the, the danger, of course, is that you then have a trade-off. You have an, an, you know, an administration that will definitely seek to be more proactive on Tigray, but then also act as a neutral party in, uh, in the guard. So that, I think, has its own uh, tensions as well and will need to be factored into any discussions about the guard and Tigray. Uh, but there's no doubt, I share your, 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 your analysis that uh, you know, we need uh, to keep the guard in focus as well and how it can be impacted. Uh, by by this uh, crisis in in Tigray, another crisis within within Ethiopia. You mentioned the impact that the new Biden administration might have on the Horn. I'm interested. What is what is the role of civil society in this conflict? What role will NGOs and UN organisations have to play in this current conflict? And are they at risk of inadvertently making the conflict uh, worse mm -hmm. by relieving some of the pressure to bring uh, this conflict to a resolution? 
Um, Simon, that is, that's an excellent question because I think part of the reason why uh, this conflict has escalated, uh, part of the reason why this conflict has become unmanageable, at least in the, in, in the current stage, is because you do not have a groundswell of public opposition to the war. Because fundamentally the country is deeply fractured uh, along ethnic lines. Uh, Tigray is just one among the ethnicities of Ethiopia. And uh, the prime minister has exploited um, the, tension, the historical rivalries between the Amhara and the Tigray. He's mobilized some of the Amhara militants to prosecute this war. So even if Abi wasn't there, they have an excuse to go against uh, Tigray. So um, he has cleverly exploited these ethnic tensions to build this uh, coalition of uh, ethnic forces again against the Tigray. The danger, of course, is that in many people's eye, this conflict is no longer about uh, a center periphery uh, tension. It is now an ethnic blood warfare, an ethnic uh, feud which is being settled. So that, I think, is, is the danger in which Ethiopia is in. Uh, but but the, the point which you raised uh, is quite significant, which is that um, why has the conflict escalated to this level? And was there anything that could have been done by local actors, by the civil society, uh, by uh, especially Ethiopia, remember, has a very strong uh, Christian tradition uh, and also a tradition of interfaith dialogue. You know, where were the churches and the mosques? Uh, how could they allow this conflict um, to have erupted in the first place? Could there have been um, some kind of preemptive diplomacy, which uh, um, you know should have been undertaken before the conflict erupted? And I think those are valid questions. Um, so what we know is so far is that uh, even civil society is not is is impacted by this uh, larger um, fragmentation of of society. So you have a civil society, a civil society which is also very ethnicized, which is fragmented and unable to sit together that broad coalition which you need in order to then um, push back against uh, a state which, is, uh, which wants war. Um, so that is quite a critical factor. Another, I think, uh, important um, uh, dynamic uh, or context is quite important to, to also put in the discussion, which is... Ethiopia has never had a history of elite compacting, you know, of elites from, from uh, across the ethnic divide, across the political divide, coming together in moments of crisis, in moments of real peril, then um, working, uh, uh, engaging in dialogue and then cutting a sort of a temporary deal to either defuse the crisis, manage the crisis, or even, um, if sustained, uh, lead to a process of, of political resolution. Um, it, has all, the, it has always been a, a very authoritarian system throughout. So there isn't that culture of actually elite compacting, uh, which can be used to diffuse tensions. And I, and I say this because uh, if, you, if you look at uh, Kenya, Kenya went into an electoral crisis, um, post-election crisis, uh, and almost went into, into, into war, um, you know, civil war. Um, but the crisis was diffused once Raila Odinga and Uhuru Kenyatta came together and agreed a pact. And I think uh, this, this um, um, potential is always interesting in African politics when you have at least a, um, a sort of a last line of defense of a state is, is the elite compact. Elites from both sides saying, um, we will all lose unless we come together and then cut a deal. Uh, that tradition, uh, unfortunately, doesn't exist in Ethiopia. And I think this is one of the key reasons why the conflict has escalated to a point where now it has become a full-scale uh, civil war. It's fascinating that you bring up that comparison to Kenya. And of course, you're referring to the so-called handshake and the Building Bridges Initiative uh, that, that took place after the election violence in 2007-8. But of course, in Kenya, that's now having political ramifications for the election next year. It's become the main focus where elites have come together and done that deal. And I think um, a lot of those, a lot of people feel left behind by that. I mean, what are the long-term consequences of deals like that? Elite compacts can be good, can be good at managing conflicts, diffusing a crisis. It can never be a tool for electoral management. Uh, and I think that is, 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 is the first rule. If you use elite, elite compacts um, as electoral 
to, to manage electoral disputes, you will be in the crisis in which Kenya is in today. You know, you will always have a dysfunctional, you, in other words, the country will not have an incentive to fix its electoral machinery. It will always say, oh, you know, we will wait for the crisis to erupt and then there will always be an elite deal. So I think uh, it can also have that dead hand, you know, and basically kill uh, institutional building. In other words, uh, elite compacts are good for, for crisis management, for crisis de-escalation. They can never be tools of long-term sustainable and, and uh, you know, stabilization. And I think that's quite important to, to distinguish. Just coming back briefly to the TPLF, and I'm thinking about other international actors. Uh, in terms of those, who are interested in continuing to support the TPLF? Uh, or do they enjoy no foreign support? Um, if you talk to the TPLF um, and the TPLF supporters, they, they, they actually accuse directly, um, of course, beyond Eritrea, um, the UAE. Uh, they say that the United Arab Emirates has been applying um, uh, drones um, to help uh, the Eritrean, but also the Ethiopian army. There is no independent way to, to verify these reports. The TPLF claims that there are two types of drones, one for surveillance and the other, which is armed, uh, conducting this uh, campaign of uh, targeted assassination. These are very serious stuff, and I think the Emiratis on their part have strenuously denied um, any involvement in the war. Um, there have been also some, some, some intelligence reports uh, of uh, increased flights from um, the Emirates towards um, Eritrea in the first week of the conflict, but also even uh, in, the last, in, the, in the middle of the conflict, which is a clear uh, probably signal that something was going on. And these are military aircraft, transport aircrafts. They can't be carrying food aid. They can't be carrying, you know, surgical masks. You know, there must be something. So I think that there, there is um, a real fear uh, that the, the Emiratis were involved in some shape or form. Um, I think for, for a variety of reasons, the Emiratis will not like to come out openly and admit this um, for a variety of reasons, uh, largely because of uh, the fear of uh, reputational damage but also the, the real risk of uh, war crimes prosecution. You know, if, uh, if it is, if the Emiratis are implicated in some of these uh, airstrikes, uh, you know, so it becomes problematic. Um, the, the Emiratis have an interest in supporting Abi, but they are also becoming, I, I think, embroiled in, our, in other conflicts as well. So um, Abu Dhabi is now a much more assertive regional power. Um, but beyond that, I think, uh, there isn't um, any other, you know, uh, there isn't any other state probably actively supporting uh, the the war um, at, the, at the current stage. However, you know, this war, as I said, um, is no longer uh, a war without regional implications. As I said, the the Sudanese and the Egyptians would be one party to watch in the coming uh, few year, few months because they could be the change. Uh, they could change the game in this conflict. If Sudan and Ethiopia go to war, then the prospect is that the Egyptians will also come into this war. And then you will have the TPLF will, will basically have the possibility of uh, getting real supply and replenishing their equipment and material. And uh, we will see then that have an impact on the battleground. Rashid, for our first conversation, I have to say this has been um, illuminating and, and absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you so very much for your time. and. Thank you also for your advocacy and information that you put out on Twitter. It keeps us all informed. Please keep it up. I know it's sometimes difficult, but we really appreciate it. And, and again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Simon. I really appreciate it. Honored, feel honored to be in this conversation.